Thessalonians chapter 5, and let's stand as we read God's Word. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and verse number 23 and 24. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, we'll begin, we're going to read both verses responsively together. And let's begin. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Our Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon the reading of your word. We thank you for the opportunity we've had to read it. We pray your blessing upon the preaching of it. Again, we thank you for the privilege that we have to have it in our hand. That we're in a country where the Word of God is preached and taught. That we have that privilege of communication with the Lord. We're not in an uncivilized area where the Word of God is, is not published. And nor are we in a country where there isn't a written Word. But we have the privilege of having a book that we call the Word of God, the Bible, in our hand that we can bring to church every day or every Sunday and that we can have every day in our house and that can speak to us and breathe the words into our hearts and into our souls and into our lives. We pray your blessing upon the reading of it and in just a bit the preaching of it we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I've been, I've, I started a series last Sunday on faithful stewardship. The series began with the requirement of steward. The man be found faithful. Being found faithful means that we are faithful. That God is, it's part of our DNA, part of our character, that we are faithful people. We cannot be faithful to God until we first know God as our personal Savior. And so <clears throat> this morning, I'm going to start with the first stewardship, and that is the stewardship of our being. The stewardship of our being. And what we're going to do is we're going to go all the way back to the beginning of how we were made. And I'd like you to go to Genesis chapter 1. The book of Genesis in chapter 1, and we're going to look in verse number 26. And we're going to see physically how we're made, and then what God did in creation, in developing us into what He wanted us to be, or creating us into what He wanted us to be. I want you to start in verse 15 of chapter 1. Actually, no, I'm sorry, I'm in chapter 2, that's why I'm not fine. It, go to verse 27 of Genesis chapter 1. So God created man in his own image. Man did not evolve as modern science, if you want to call it that, has taught today. Uh, it, is no, it is neither science nor a good theory. The theory of evolution has continued to be taught as a theory. Man was created and he was created differently than all living things. Plants, amoebas, animals, monkeys specifically because, you know, that was the big one because, you know, that's that's a progression. It's interesting, I've, I've said this before, it's interesting that it, that is still taught in the public schools. You have the pictures of all of those, the, the Piltdown Man and the Java Man and uh, all the different Homo sapien things that have been found, supposedly found, and every one of them were a hoax. Every one of them were proven to be a hoax but they're still in our textbooks. Just like 
dinosaurs that they've created are still in our textbooks that are billions and billions and billions of years old like they were back there to record it why people can't just believe what God tells us I made man I made him in my image verse 27 says so God created man in his own image in the image of God created he him male and female created he them and God blessed them and God said unto them be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth go from there to chapter 2 and go to verse 23 actually verse um, 20 20 of Genesis 2 and Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found and help meet for him. Uh, we didn't need Darwin to do that because Adam beat him to the punch. He was the very first man and he did it from the very beginning. And he called them all by their names. So there were, they were already classified before Darwin. So, so if you will, Darwin plagiarized or actually... He broke copyright laws because their names were already given and he changed the names. Verse 21. It says in verse 20 that there was not a help found, a meat for him, meaning there wasn't an animal designed specifically for Adam and so, or a being designed specifically for Adam because he was not an animal. Verse 21, it says, Then the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs, God, took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man and Adam said this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man so God first made man from the dust of the ground and then he made Eve from a bone out of the man. And then in chapter 3, we have them in a perfect relationship and a perfect utopia with God. Physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. And then something happens. Adam and Eve were made very good, the Bible says. They were perfect. They were sinless. God had told them there was one, one thing they were not to do. That was to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Satan had fallen at this time and was in the serpent, which is a beautiful creature, a beautiful being, the Bible says it was more subtle in verse 1 of chapter 3 of Genesis, more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. So he begins to question and cast doubt in Eve's mind about this decision to eat it or not to eat it. And this choice was a choice. So the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now leave your finger there. We're going to come back to it. And I want you to go to back to chapter 1. And I want you to hear what, what God actually said to the man and the woman. Beginning in verse 29. God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a, of a tree yielding to you it shall be for meat and to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to every creeping thing upon the earth wherein there is life I have given every herb for meat and it was so 
Uh, go back a little farther and look in verse... Actually, it's chapter 2. Verse 7 says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the, of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became what? A living soul. So first he made his body and there was no life in it. And he formed it of the dust. Basically dirt. Um, scientists have said if you add up all of the actual worth of the chemicals we're, we're not worth a whole lot and when we die we go to the dust our body just decays verse 8 and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden and there he put the man whom he had formed that included woman man and woman and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life, also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison. And so it goes on and lists the rivers. Now, verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the, into the, the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Once, he be, once life was breathed into him, he became a living soul. God put him in that garden with his wife. And this is where they lived. It was this perfect utopia. It couldn't have been more beautiful. It couldn't have been, could, couldn't have been more self-sufficient. And it was just a wonder. Verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that a man that the man should be alone. I will make and help meet for him. And out of the garden, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and so forth. And we read that what happened. He made a woman. And Adam told his wife, we know by chapter 3, what God had said. So, life is good. They have a body. They have a soul. And they have a spirit. Which is that part of them that would communicate with God. And we know that they communicated with God because in chapter 3, if you'll look, it says in verse 8, They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. So they weren't just like a bunch of animals. They weren't just a body and a soul. They didn't just have a, you know, a, a just personality, just emotion, and just physical capability. They were upright, and they had an ability to communicate with a holy God. And they were sinless. They had not, at this point, done anything to disobey God. Sin is a transgression of the law. Sin is doing what God tells you not to do. And when you do break God's law, you disobey God, that is considered sin, and sin brings death. So, the serpent comes to, Adam, uh, to Eve, and he says to her, you won't die. Now, Adam told her, you, you will die. This is what God says, you won't die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof that your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So basically, you'll be God, and you'll dictate yourself what is good and what is evil. That's exactly where we are today. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired... To make one wise, this is the lie that she was told by the serpent. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, 
and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of God walking in the garden. Of course, they hid. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked and I hid myself. Well, you know the rest of the story. God judged them. God cast them out of the garden. God put an angel at each gate so they couldn't get in at each entrance. And now they're on their own. He did have the compassion to make skins for them, which was a representation of covering of sin with blood. But now they have a body, and they have a soul, and they have a dead spirit. Paul, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and verse 23, makes a statement. And there's, there's two schools of thought. One school of thought teaches that man is a dichotomy, that he's only two parts, and that the soul and the spirit are the same. I don't believe that. And I believe that I can show you that, and you can see it in Scripture. I believe man is a trichotomy, a three-part being, and Paul breaks it down and he defines it here in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. He separates all three parts of man. And he says in verse 23, I pray the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And there's every part of you. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Now go to Hebrews 4.12 and then we will establish that they are separate, they are all different, and then we will get into how to be a steward of each part of us and how to be a steward, a good steward of our being. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, the Bible is very clear that God separates the soul and the spirit. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. The Bible separates them. And of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so God has designed us with three parts. We have a body, and that is the vehicle, that is the physical part of us, which responded by taking what it shouldn't. And the moment it did, it became sinful. And the Bible refers to that as the flesh. And I want you to listen to me very carefully, because the Bible says of our flesh, Paul said, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. The moment Adam and Eve sinned, they immediately had an awareness in their conscience that they had done something evil. It wasn't what the serpent told them was going to happen. The serpent told them, when you make this choice, life's going to be good. Life was nothing of the sort. Life now becomes very, very bad. They're judged one by one. Adam, God says, is going to work by the sweat of his face. And he mentions physically how difficult life would be. The sweat of his face, is, that's, that's hard labor. See, God, God watered the ground and all Adam had to do was dress and keep it. Now he has to plant the crops. He has to water the crops. He has to, he has to weed the crops. And, and I was raised on a farm and believe me, it's not easy work. My dad is here and I remember as, as a five-year-old boy irrigating with him two, three o'clock in the morning, early morning. You did it early. And anybody that's been raised on a farm, you know you have to get up early. And, you have, and, and, and it's, a, it's a full day's work. 
life got more stressful, more difficult physically than it had ever been. And that was one of the judgments upon Adam for sinning. Eve was, was given pain in childbirth. Now, wouldn't that be wonderful if you could just bring babies into the world and no pain? Eve never got to experience that. Because she had the children after they were cast out of the garden. And the Bible says that she would serve her husband. That's been an ongoing conflict from the beginning of time. The conflict between husband and wife. We'll get, that's another stewardship. We're not dealing with that today. And then <clears throat> the serpent. Of course, he's going to crawl on the, his belly and eat dust for the rest of his life. So we have a, a man who was perfect, a woman who was perfect. He sins and now is sentenced to have to work the rest of his life. And Eve is sentenced to have to answer to her husband. He's over her. And she also has pain during childbirth. childbirth. Uh, my daughter was in pain when she was having that little one. And there's joy now, but she, if you know Julianne, Julianne's is about as easy going. She snapped at one of the nurses in the doc, in, in the, I don't know what she did, but um, whatever she did, she didn't like. And Edwin had not seen my daughter like that. You know, the sweet little Julianne. You know, when you're in pain, you want stuff and you want it right now, okay? And so, anyway. So, our bodies have a body, our, our being has a body. That we know is going to die and it goes to the dust. It's a vehicle. It would be like our, our way of getting around places. But it is very controlling. Very difficult to deal with. Because it's filled with appetites and cravings and lusts. And it, it physically, because of sin, does not want to do what God wants it to do. Now, I'll give you an example. Those of you who pray and those of you who read your Bible, you, you, you've probably experienced this. When you have well intent you know good intentions and and you're you're on your knees and you're praying all of a sudden you start thinking of things that you had you hadn't been thinking all day and now your mind is just flooded with thoughts oh man I forgot I had this appointment and I got to go here and I got to go there and it's telling you I don't want to pray I want to eat I want to sleep I want to do something else. You also get very mysteriously tired. Now you weren't tired before because you just watched two hours of TV and you didn't fall asleep. But you just started to pray and now all of a sudden you're seriously sleepy. Or you got a headache now. Our bodies have ways of distracting us spiritually. And we just kind of pass it off as, well, but there's something wrong with you. You know, it has nothing to do with any, you, it, it, you having anything wrong with you. It has to do with the fact that you are living in a sinful body that hates and despises anything that has to do with spiritual things. Because when you sin, you got an evil nature. And that nature is it, it's resting in what the Bible calls the old man. So the old Adam, the old Eve, which were made perfect, but now have become imperfect, have a body which is evil. And that body affects the soul 
The body would be nothing without the soul because the moment the soul leaves the body, that body is dormant and is dead and goes to the dust. And so without the life of the soul that God breathed into that body, we are nothing. This body just goes to the grave, and that, but that soul lives eternally. It is an eternal part of us. It is not the spirit. It is separate. The soul, the Bible says, that sinneth, it shall die. We know the body is going to die. It's appointed and a man wants to die and after this a judgment. The Bible talks about the body being, that it's going to die. It's going to corrupt and it's going to go to the grave. But the soul that sins, it will die and it will spend eternity in one of two places. The Bible is very clear. It either will spend eternity in hell or it will spend an eternity in heaven with the Lord. And so it's very important that we understand our body and we understand the propensity that we have for it and recognize it when it raises its ugly head in our life. But it also is important for us to understand the soul. The soul is our mind and our will and our emotions. It is that part of us which is our personality, the individual uniqueness. Yes, our bodies are all unique. There's not one body made the same, and that's how people identify us and look at us and see us. But our soul is very unique, and that soul has within it what is called a will. I will do what my body tells me, or I won't. I will do what my spirit is telling me, or I won't. The spirit became dysfunctional when Adam and Eve sinned. They, they needed redemption. They needed a change. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So the past of having a body that is sinful and, and a soul that is on its way to hell and a spirit that is dead that doesn't have the right or the ability to communicate with God because it's not functional is changed in a moment when a person trusts Jesus. That happened to me on December 9th, 1973. It was the greatest day of my life. It will be 43 years this December. And I will not forget that day. I was not on my knees, but I was sitting in a pew. It was in the very back of an auditorium of our church. I was a teenager. I was 14 years of age. And God convicted me, and God had been working in my heart for quite some time about my need to trust Christ, I had friends who thought I was saved, thought I knew the Lord. I didn't know the Lord. I was just going through the motions. I'd been, I'd been baptized as a kid. And, and I thought for years that that was what was going to save me. Water, the water that we're going to baptize Elena with this, this morning, in this, after, this morning service, that has nothing to do with washing away sin whatsoever. It means nothing. It pictures salvation that... When you stand up in the water, it pictures Jesus on the cross. And you're identifying with that fact that he, he's the only one that f could die and pay for your sins. You go into the water, it pictures that Jesus Christ was buried in the grave and was there for three days and three nights. When you come up out of the water, it pictures that Jesus rose from the dead. And we, as we come up out of the water, are raised to walk in newness of life, that our life is to be different. And so the stewardship of our, of our being is the fact of what we allow our body to do, what we allow our soul to be influenced by, and then how much of an encouragement we are to our spirit, which is the perfect part of us that does not sin and always will be perfect, and when we stand before God, will be blameless. Paul is saying, I pray God your whole body and soul and spirit 
be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Your spirit will be nothing but blameless because your spirit is that part of you that God regenerated that is never going to be sinful because it is that part that God put in you to make you a new creature in Christ. But your body sins and defiles itself and your soul sins. The Bible tells us of the soul, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? In the stewardship of our being, we have to be careful what we do to our body because we can lose our body. We get a witness? Amen? I mean, you know, people do things and, when, and choices people make, they, they ruin their bodies. But we can also do that with our soul. The Bible says the soul that sinneth it shall die. And so if we are not careful, we can allow the influences of our evil body to influence our soul to do things that actually sentence us to a Christless eternity to hell. And what happens is, now, we lose our soul. It never has the privilege of being in the house of God. It never has the privilege anymore of being in heaven. It is eternally doomed to be punished in the lake of fire for eternity. When I heard that at 14 years of age, that changed my life. I always believed there was judgment. I always believed that there was a loving God. And I believed also that God judged. But I never, I'd, I'd never had anybody explain how to change that. And so on December 9th, 1973, I'd heard enough messages from our pastor to understand that the moment I opened my heart to Christ and I, I asked him to save me and to come into my life, that he would change me to the point where I no longer with my soul had to be influenced by my evil, sinful body and that He could give me the power over that to be able to yield to the Spirit to what the Bible calls the new man. And it's a choice. Every day that we awake, uh, we don't have time, but you can read Romans 6, 5, or 6, 7, and 8. It, it, Romans 6 deals with Yielding your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. That's physical. Romans chapter 7 deals with the struggle of the decision of the soul. Will I choose to do what I shouldn't do? Or will I choose to do what I know I'm supposed to do? And then Romans 8 deals with the relationship of the Holy Spirit with our spirit and allowing our spirit to control and influence our soul. Now here's, the, here's what you need to remember, and I'm going to leave you with this thought, and then we're going to close the service. The Bible says, of, is, it, it explains stewardship as managing something that doesn't belong to you. Now follow me. The Bible says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, and ye are not, what? Your own. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You say, well, where's the soul there? It's assumed because the soul is what makes the choice of whether you're going to glorify God by the Spirit or you're going to glorify Satan and sin. And so the decision as a steward is, what will I do in the management of my being with God? Am I going to take the stewardship of my life and I'm, am I going to take the stewardship of my body and the stewardship of my soul and the stewardship of my spirit? And am I going to just succumb to just 
que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be, just, let my, just live my life with no regard for a decision, with no regard for accountability, with no regard to anything in relation to spiritual matters? Or am I going to manage my life and be a steward of my life and allow God to work in me in a spiritual way and have a relationship with the Holy Spirit that actually literally controls me and manages where I go and what I do and what I say and I glorify God in everything that I do. That's stewardship. That's why Paul says, I pray God that your whole body and soul and spirit be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the Bible says, faithful is he, God, who also will do it. You see, most of us would sit here and would say, Pastor, that's impossible. I've tried. We really haven't. It is always possible. All things are possible to him that believeth because we have a faithful God who says, I will see it accomplished if you will help. You will do what I'm asking you to do. You'll trust me by faith. You'll trust my son. You'll live your life with a different mindset. You'll allow my word to penetrate your heart and allow it to change your life. This is the most powerful book in the world, the Word of God. It's life-changing. I have not lived it like I should, and nor does, has anybody in this room, and nor can anybody ever fully until we get to heaven. We're not perfect. But this book has changed my life. And this book can change all of our lives in this room. But not to what I'm, I'm wanting you to be. Or not to what anybody else in this room wants you to be. But what He wants you to be. Let's bow our heads for a moment. Heads back.